thank you everybody for sticking it out. You know, I know you could be outside basking in the lovely, lovely late April Chicago weather, um, but instead you chose to be here. So for that, I thank you. My name is uh, Maddie Stratton. I am a DevOps advocate for PagerDuty. I'm wearing a PagerDuty shirt. This is one of the last times you're gonna hear me talk about PagerDuty throughout this talk, except for a little bit when we talk about how we do things at PagerDuty. If you're interested in knowing more about PagerDuty, come talk to me afterwards, that would be fantastic. They pay my bills, they enabled me to come here, so I have to like at least mention PagerDuty. So yay, good for that. Um, also, a small plug, since we are in Chicago, I'm in the organizer of, uh, an organizer of DevOps Days Chicago, which will be at the end of August. Our call for papers is open through the end of the week, so if you would like to propose a talk, please do that. And also, please mark your calendars. We'd love for you to uh, join us. It's a great two-day event for uh, practitioners and things like that. So, welcome to my talk. This is called Fight, Flight, or Freeze, Releasing Organizational Trauma. Uh, this title is one of the longest titles I've ever put on a talk, but I do plan to have an even longer title next year. So, there it goes. So uh, first thing, just I like to put a little content warning here. So there's some discussion of the concepts of trauma and post-traumatic stress. There's no specific trauma discussion in here, but I do talk about post-traumatic stress um, as a concept. And additionally, along those lines, something very important to get out of the way is I am a trauma survivor. I am not a mental health professional. I'm a DevOps advocate. I talk about culture, I talk about organizations. So this is not medical advice. In fact, we're not gonna be talking about in how advice about individual trauma, we're gonna be talking about how organizations respond to incidents and outages using things that we've learned from post-traumatic stress um, as, as a metaphor. So consider the zebra, right? So a zebra that's at rest with no threat of predators uh, is operating within what we call the rest and digest functions of the parasympathetic nervous system, right? It's just chilling out, being a zebra, chewing on some grass, maybe thinking about making baby zebras. I don't know, it's all good. This is called rest and digest. As its name implies, he's just chilling out. Now, introduce a lion into this equation, right? So the zebra is now being chased by a lion. And there are drastic physiological changes that happen with the activation of the fight or flight response of the sympathetic nervous system, right? So the zebra's heart rate increases, the breathing increases, large amounts of stress hormones like cortisol and adrenaline are released into the zebra's bloodstream, pupils dilate, the blood pressure increases, and most importantly, non-essential functions like digestion stop. The zebra's nervous system is preparing for it to literally run for its life. Now, if the zebra is caught, the nervous system is overwhelmed and it has no further solutions. This is the freeze response. The zebra basically is playing dead. So this is also the point that in a non-zebra, we would consider the introduction of trauma. Now, if zebra plays dead, freezes, lion drops the zebra, goes looking for another zebra, zebra maybe can now escape. And what does the zebra do? Does anybody know what happens to the zebra? It literally shakes itself out, right? Shakes itself out, moves on with its life, moves along, right? The zebra that survives this encounter shakes it out and returns to a resting state. Now this next slide is possibly the most important slide of this talk. If not the most important slide, you are gonna see in this entire conference. So if you're gonna take a picture of any slide, it's gonna be this one. So get ready for some thought leadering. Humans are not zebras. So the autonomic nervous system is common to all mammals. So this is something we have in common with zebras. We all have the autonomic nervous system. But one of the things that we have as humans that other mammals don't is a prefrontal cortex. And usually the prefrontal cortex is an advantage, right? This is where executive function happens, how we understand the difference between good and bad, same and different, pattern recognition, understanding consequences. These all come and they all happen in the executive response of the prefrontal cortex. So this is an advantage, right? However, this is also where we mentally replay traumatic scenarios, right? which activates our sympathetic nervous system 
exactly like a real threat would. This is something that's unique to us. Other mammals don't have this. That's why zebras can shake it off because they don't have something that reminds them of a, of a lion make them have that exact same activation. So Dr. Peter Levine, who I stole the zebra analogy from, he has said, and I don't usually read slides, but this is a good quote, right? He says, so animals in the wild, they're not traumatized by routine threats to their lives. This doesn't cause trauma to a zebra. But humans are readily overwhelmed, and they're subject to traumatic symptoms of hyperarousal, shutdown, and dysregulation. So this is a difference between us and the other mammals. So what do we mean when we talk about hyperarousal, when we talk about dysregulation? So if we think in a healthy nervous system, this is kind of what we call the window of tolerance. So something starts to happen, our sympathetic nervous system gets activated, we kind of get keyed up into the fight response or flight response, and then we're okay, we settle, we bring back down into our own rest and digest. This is a typical healthy nervous system. And this is the range that we call the window of tolerance, right? It's a zone of emotional arousal that's optimal for well-being and effective functioning. So remember, the parasympathetic is the rest and digest. It's conserving energy, whereas sympathetic is the fight or flight response. Now, when we introduce a traumatic event, this is when we have a symptom of undischarged traumatic stress. So we start to get activated and something traumatic occurs, and then we can start to see, instead of having this, you know, operating within the window of tolerance, we either get, we can be going, being dysregulated up and down and up and down, or we can also sometimes become stuck on or stuck off. So stuck on is basically being up in fight or flight all the time, right? So these, some of the symptoms around that are anxiety, panic, hyperactivity, digestive problems, hypervigilance, sleeplessness, or, Sometimes our effect, the effect of trauma is to be stuck off, right? And that's where we see things like depression coming in, lethargy. Also, uh, digestive problems, low blood pressure. And these are things that happen outside. So again, so the, up at the top, being stuck on is called hyperarousal. This is being similar to the fight or flight response all the time. Being stuck off is hypoarousal, and that's similar to being frozen, if you will. Now, Trauma is not simple. There's nuance to this, right? It's not a simple thing. This is why people have written books upon books upon books and given lots of talks and go to school for years and years and years to understand trauma. There's a lot of nuance to it. So one thing is when trauma happens, right, this is because a nervous system has been overwhelmed. So when one solution, the active response to the threat does not work, that's what causes trauma. It can the activation is the same for real or imagined threats, right? It can be a real threat or one that happened. The thing about our human brains that we think are so amazing, they're also not always the sharpest things. They can't tell the difference between a real threat and the memory of a threat or something that reminds us of a threat. So real or perceived threats will create the same nervous system activation. And it's subjective and relative. So what I consider overwhelming or my capacity for a solution is going to be different from what you perceive as overwhelming. So there's a lot of nuance to this. So how does this apply to an organization, right? Because it's talking about releasing organizational trauma. We're talking about the companies and organizations that we work with, the groups of humans and that are trying to accomplish a result. How does this idea apply? So let's go back and think about the window of tolerance again, right? So if we think about a deregulated nervous system, and how might this apply to an organization when a traumatic event occurs? And for purposes of the discussion, trauma to an organization, as I'm referring to it, would be something like an incident or an outage, something that is preventing the business from being able to do the thing that the business exists to do, right? It's actively preventing customers from being able to work. It's causing an outage. Something like that are traumatic uh, instances for an organization. So, we talked about hyperarousal, being stuck in fight or flight. So organizations that are stuck hyperaroused, they display effects maybe of constant vigilance. It sounds like they're fighting Voldemort, right? We're always watching for the other shoe to drop. They're hyper aware of threats. 
And this takes energy away from innovation, it takes energy away from moving forward. These are organizations that, to use analogy, are kind of always looking over their shoulder. They're waiting for an attack. This is often reflected in how leadership approaches outages and issues. You hear a lot of wartime metaphors in organizations like this because they're on the defense, right? We're, we're in wartime, we're in peacetime, we're using a lot of military metaphors. Another symptom of this is um, you see uh, organizations like this will traditionally have a dedicated team to support that handles all of the issues and outages because they have to beef up and make sure you've got a preventative perimeter around anything that might possibly go wrong. Now, the other side of this is being hypo-aroused. This is being stuck off. So organizations like this tend to be afraid to innovate, to change, because as we all know, what introduces outages? Well, most of the time it's change. We know this. This is an accepted thing. But for some organizations, it's not. Some organizations are actually working in these, this freeze response where we can't change anything, because if we do, it might cause an outage. It might cause an issue. And this can happen at the scale of the large organization or even within the teams. And I think about an example of being uh, in this metaphor. So I had a colleague years ago um, here in Chicago who was a tech ops director for an e-commerce company here. And her bonus was based upon the uptime of the website that her team ran. So outages, so she was stuck off. She did not want any change to happen because literally it was money out of her pocket. But this prevented the organization from being able to innovate because they were stuck off, because their ops team was stuck off. Now, so we want to think about what is appropriate and inappropriate response to, this type, to these organizational traumatic effects and events. So get news for you. The systems that we run are very complex, right? They're not simple. And every incident and every outage is different. They may have flavors that seem similar, but what happens is we see signals that remind us of a similar outage, and we think it's gonna be the same thing again. But it usually is not, because our systems are complex. So we look for pattern recognition because that's a thing that we like to do as humans. We want to pattern match. We want to say this looks like this thing. This is the whole concept when we think about systems thinking is we want the simple answer, right? We want to say the re way we could fix poverty is by doing this. It's this one thing would do that because we want a simple answer by finding a pattern recognition. But our systems are complex. So when we see s signals that look like a previous example, they remind us of this, but we want to respond the same way. But the symptoms are, the signals are indicating us into something that is very different. So how many people uh, got on an airplane to come here? Okay, great. How many people had to take their shoes off? Oh, okay, a bunch of you have pre-checked, so that's great. Um, but let's think about this idea that we remove our shoes because of the TSA. So in December 22nd of 2001, this cat named Richard Reed, he decided to try to ignite some explosives that were hidden in his shoes on this flight from Paris to Miami, right? I, it didn't work, so that's great. But so then the TSA began randomly searching people's shoes. That was sort of thing. They're like, well, one dude tried to like do a shoe bomb. So all shoes, therefore, might have bombs. And then in 2006, the TSA mandates that all passengers must remove their shoes going through security. So this is a pattern match that's trying to happen because we're saying the signals look similar, which are people wear shoes. I love this tweet here, right? So Jennifer Brea says, there's a saying in medicine that when you hear, hear hoofbeats, the first thing that should come to mind is a horse, not a zebra. This too cute by phrase has killed many, many zebras. So we have to learn to stop jumping on the first root cause. This is, the, this is an example of that. We look, root cause analysis will lead us towards finding the first thing that sounds like it makes sense because we're expecting there to be one thing. And this is an example of why we think about the fact when we think about incidents and outages, we need to look at contributing factors. We aren't saying this is the one thing that caused it because there's never one thing. The other thing is, hey, look, it's more zebras. So that's part of the theme. So what can we do to understand our window of tolerance as an organization? How can we identify when our organization is becoming 
deregulated. And one of the first things to do is when we think about our after incident reports, our postmortems, whatever we call them, how are we taking them? What is it causing us to do as an organization? These are questions that I would say ask yourself. Look at how your organization responds to an outage or to an incident. Is it, an, is it looked at as a gift? Because that's what incidents are. They're a way for our systems to tell us something we didn't know before. But we don't usually think about them that way. We think about them as something that caused trauma to our business being able to work. So um, another quote, you know, resilient organizations are not traumatized by routine threats to their mission or business. Uh, Non-resilient organizations are readily overwhelmed and subject to the symptoms of overreaction, shutdown, and lack of regulated effort. This is me, and I'm not a doctor, but this is taking Peter Levine's quote and kind of saying, how does this apply to organizations, right? So we're just like animals in the wild are not traumatized by routine threats. The same thing, a resilient organization, these are things that are going to happen. Our organizations are going to have incidents and outages. They should not cause trauma. An organization that is not resilient, they become overwhelmed by them, right? And so they will overreact, overcompensate, overcorrect, may cause shutdown and a lack of regulated effort. And we need to regulate. And this is not a reference to Warren G. That's when I date myself, when I talk about this. But how do humans and organizations take, when we've identified we are in a deregulated state and we need to become regulated? What are the things we can do? Because it's great when you say, okay, great, Maddie, you told us we identified that our organizations get stuck on or they get stuck off. Okay, now let's move on to the part when we can do something about it. What are some of the actions and activities we can take? So one of the treatments for post-traumatic stress is something called eye movement desensitization and re reprocessing, also known as EMDR. And what happens is the patient's difficult memories are offset with a positive association, which is reinforced with external stimuli. So what's happening is it could be with blinking lights or tappers or an audio signal. But what's happening is we're taking a positive association, reinforcing it with a physiological response. So this, what's, what's happened, it activates our brain to be able to make this positive association with a difficult memory. Because we talk about going to the body first, and just like we said that our body remembers this associated trauma, this is creating different triggers. Well, how can we do EMDR for our organization? Well, we can't put little blinking lights in all of our cubes and create little tappers and do those types of things, but we can achieve a similar response. What we want to do is be able to take the symptoms of an incident or outage and create a muscle memory, if you will, within our organization, within our practitioners, within ourselves, which can help alleviate the stress of incidents and outages. So we want to make an association with outages with and issues with a safe place, as I mentioned, right? So game days are something that can really help with this, but they have to be done properly. So a game day is when we're simulating some type of an outage, some type of an incident, to go through our process to understand how we do this. Now, the trick of this is it's not to practice under pressure. We don't do this so we can stress our people out so they get used to being under a lot of stress. What we wanna do is create, a re associate response with a safe environment. So when we're exploring in a game day, it's a little bit like meditation, right? With some kinds of trauma, meditation is helpful. But the problem is when people go into their inner landscape and they're not prepared and they're not guided, they're going to encounter their trauma, right? And then what do they do? They don't have guidance. They don't know what to do with that. So they might be overwhelmed with it. They might find a way to go around it. Similarly, if we don't have plans in place with our game day, we're gonna get wound around the axle around little things we run into through the process, right? We don't have some type of a plan. Um, also in meditation for trauma, we can encounter something that Peter Levine calls bliss bypass, which itself is a way of avoiding trauma. So the thing is if our game day is not following our usual rules of instant response, we've actually made it too safe. We've made it too much like, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna practice this thing, but not the real way. 
We're not going to actually have an incident commander. We're not going to actually use pager duty. We're not going to actually go into Slack to do it. We're going to practice it in a different way. So if you do plan failure injection in a game day, which is um, a form, some might say it's a form of chaos engineering. We can you know, split hairs about that at some other time. But plan failure injection is a common thing to do as part of a game day exercise, where we say we know we're going to take something and we're going to break it on purpose. And the great thing is we know well, what's broken because we broke it, right? So if we're going to do these, so we, we need to run them like a real incident. So we run something at PagerDuty called Failure Fridays. So on Fridays, during business hours, we will, you know, a system is nominated and we inject failure into that system. But the thing is we run it like a real incident. We have an incident commander. We run it inside our Slack war room, inside a dedicated Slack war room. We have a channel for it. We use pager duty throughout it. We track it like an incident, and we write a postmortem. And the reason that we do this is because it's creating an organizational association of a safe place for incidents. This is another reason why you should always run incidents at their initial severity. So this can happen a lot, right? Something comes in, it looks like it's a high severity incident. You start working the problem, and you're like, oh, this turned out it wasn't a real big deal. This doesn't mean you stop your incident response process. You should run it all the way to its course. And the reason for that is it gave you practice at doing incident response. And it's not just about practice about remembering how to do it, which is a great thing because Generally, we're living in a world where these things don't happen as often as they used to, and on-call rotations are getting, long, are getting uh, more spaced out, so we don't spend as much time doing these things. We want it to be that instant response is just a thing that we do. We're used to it, right? It's just part of business as usual. And this is a good reason to run game days during business hours, if you can, if that's what makes sense to you, because it's a calm time, because it's already going to be stressful enough when you have an outage at 2 in the morning. You want to have this association with what it was like when, it, when you were running through this exercise in the middle of the day when everyone was around. And this is one of the most important things is you have to process the failure, right? It's not just enough to go through the motions and restore service. That's really important. That's actually job one during an incident is restore service. But we have to process this. And the ideas around blamelessness and faultlessness, that's a really hard one to say, um, is just the beginning. It's not just enough to say we do postmortems that are blameless. We have to actually process the failure and the outage through all the information that we have. And the most important thing is this processing has to have a conclusion. It has to end. We have to tell the story. Otherwise, it becomes unprocessed organizational trauma. It's this thing that's still hanging out there. So there's a misconception that to process trauma is to get it all out. We're not talking about getting it all out. What we need to do is integrate our experiences into a coherent whole. And what does this mean? This means including in telling our stories as well as changing our autonomic nervous systems, which in the case of an organization has to do with how we respond to outages and incidents. So I think it's really, really important that we are telling stories. This means we are sharing our postmortems. This telling, the way we process trauma is by sharing and telling the stories and working our way through it. This happens for individuals, but also for an organization. I like to say that a write-only postmortem does not help anyone. So doing postmortems is not like doing your taxes, right? It's not like, well, we have this template. We had an outage. I got to fill it out. I filled it out. It went off into Google Docs somewhere, and we'll never see it again. It not only does it need to be shared, but it's really, really helpful when we look at these as storytelling exercises, because these are also ways that questions get raised that we're able to work our way through this. And one thing that's really uh, interesting, so uh, J. Paul Reed wrote his dissertation on uh, postmortems in IT. And one of the interesting things that came out of his dissertation and his, his research was that the larger the organization he was working with, the less likely it was that teams shared their postmortems outside of their team. They kept them to themselves. The irony is the larger the organization, the more important it is to share these postmortems outside of your team because of these complex systems and because of the more uh, siloed effect that you have in a larger organization. People outside of your, you have to be able to tell the story to them because they're going to see it with different eyes and be able to increase your learning. 
as well as it's helping you as a team, as an individual, and as your larger organization process this outage all the way through to its natural conclusion, and now it's done, and now we can move on to the next thing. So in top-down therapy, it starts with emotions, right? Why do you feel the way that you do? This is similar to looking for root cause first. So in somatic experiencing, the body is worked with first, right? To enable this titrated approach to the emotions. So similarly, during an incident, you're working to restore service prior to determining cause. And it's important to look at the whole system and not start with these emotions, which are the symptoms of the outage. As I talked about before, the problem with, root, with looking for a root cause is the first thing you find is what is going to seem to be the end of your exploration, when in fact there are many contributing factors. And I want to talk a little bit now um, about this idea of cognitive distortions. So they're what their name implies. They're distortions in our cognition, right? They're perspectives with bias. They're irrational thoughts and beliefs that we unknowingly reinforce over time. So these patterns and systems of thought are often really subtle, and it's difficult to recognize them when they're a regular feature of your day-to-day -day thoughts. So there's as many as 16 generally accepted cognitive distortions. I'm not going to go through all 16. We're going to touch on a few that might be causing issues for you in your organization. So uh, one is polarized thinking. So this is also known as all or nothing thinking. This is seeing everything in extremes. It's either perfection or total failure. Remember, our systems are always in some state of degradation. Our systems are always failing somewhere. They are not perfect. We don't have 100% uptime. And if we are thinking about this, that we're either everything is great and everything is working perfectly, or our systems are a piece of shit. And the reality is somewhere in between. So we have to watch out for this polarized thinking. There's also overgeneralization. This is where we take a single instance and generalize it into an overall pattern. Uh, at a personal level, this could be, oh, I got a C on this test, so I'm stupid and I'm a failure. Right? In an organization, it can be, well, we had a SEB1 incident on this particular service, so it's unstable and unreliable. Combined with another distortion, which is called the mental filter, this can manifest as only seeing the negative and eliminating all positives about a situation, a person, or a product. So it's very easy for us to sit down and say, oh, it's always that system. That system is always having issues. It must be terrible. And then we start to generalize into the people who run those systems, who create those systems. Um, we do fortune telling a lot in IT. We feel like if we only had enough data, we can be predictive. Hey, machine learning. So if we only know enough, we can predict the future, right? We just need enough data. So yes, we can start to get ideas about what is likely to happen. But guess what? Systems are complex, right? We need to be able to understand that our predictions are not fact but they're actually just one of several positive outcomes. Think back to the Avengers Infinity War. When, you know, if you were Dr. Strange was like, you saw 15 million different possible outcomes and one of them was the good one. So this is the thing with our, uh, we cannot determine exactly what is going to happen. Our predictions are one of several possible outcomes. So we don't want to be, to feel like if we only knew enough, we could know exactly what was going to happen. Um, I, I'm reminded of, um, Years ago, when I was working for an e-commerce company, and we were introducing A-B testing. And one of the things that happened, this was pre-agile, and we worked in Waterfall, and blah, blah, blah. So this is why this happened the way it did. But we said during an A-B test, we couldn't make changes to the website. Because we're running a test, we wanted to understand. And our product people said, oh, no, no, but I know what changes you can make that won't affect what the customer does. And I was like, well, if you know that, why do we need to test anything? Because you're clearly a psychic genius. Um, so we do this a lot, and very smart people do this. This is not, you know, this is very, very common. Um, a control fallacy manifests as one of two beliefs. Either one, we have no control over anything in our lives, and we're helpless victims of fate. Or that we are in complete control of everything in our surroundings, giving us responsibility for the feelings of those around us. Both of these are really damaging, and they're both equally inaccurate, right? We don't have a complete lack of control. We also don't control all the things. No one's in complete control. Even in extreme situations, when an individual seemingly has no choices in what they do, they have a certain amount of control how they approach it. Now, this comes in. This is an ops thing. 
So I've spent most of my career in ops, so I can kind of talk about my, my, my people. So we feel in ops that if we control everything, no bad things will happen, right? If only we could keep those cowboy developers out of the system. If we could maintain control, then everything would be amazing. The reality is we do not have full control over our system. And then likewise, we don't completely lack control. This happens a lot in IT as well. We'll sit there and say, well, I've got, I don't know, management, right? What are you going to do? I can't do anything. So it's somewhere in between. And the final thing I want to think about here, so we're talking about incidents, outages, how we handle them. How many people here um, are currently on call or part of an on-call rotation? Okay. Uh, how many people have been on call in their career? Like this is a thing you've done. Okay, great. So self-care super matters because everything about being on call is stressful. Everything about the experience is almost designed to raise your stress levels. Just hearing your pager go off causes a physiological response. So I want to think about some of the things you can do to make this, how can you take care of yourself when you're in an on-call rotation? And why does it matter? Burnout is a real thing. It's becoming an even bigger thing in our industry because we are taking on more and more. We take more and more personal ownership around our systems. And, we're, and it is causing more and more issues. One of the things we do at PagerDuty, one of the big reasons why I'm still part of the company and why I feel like I'm in a good place is we have, we have features in our product that help measure burnout in on-call teams. Because we're able to look at that and say, is your team healthy? It's not, is your system healthy? Are your people healthy? Because it has an absolute effect. And even if you don't care about the humane levels of the people you work with, it costs, I believe the number is on average in this country, over $300,000 to replace an engineer. It's better to keep your people than to have to replace them when they burn out. So if all you care about is the bottom line, there you go. So we want to think about context switching. Create a ritual around going on and off call, right? This helps your body understand that things are changing. There's a lot to do with a physiological response. So an, an example around this is uh, when I take out my contacts, I get sleepy. And this is because, and when I put them in, I wake up. And this is because of decades upon decades of putting contacts in my eyes in the morning and taking them out before bed. My body has expectations. It actually physiologically changes whether or not I have contacts in. And it's not whether or not I have them in, it's the process of taking them out and putting them in. So when we do things, like uh, I talk to people who have an on-call hoodie. They wear a special hoodie when they're on-call. And the reason is because they can take it off. And it's literally releasing a weight when they're like, I am not on-call anymore. My body knows and can change. You need to allocate mental bandwidth properly, right? So if you're on-call, allow this to be your number one priority. Don't try to deliver high priority projects during the time that you are on call. Now, having a good relationship with your manager is really key for this. Work with her to help under her understand where you're coming from and help set the expectations to say like during this time, one of the things that can help, uh, I see a lot of people that will tell me that when they're on call, the projects they work on are remediation or resiliency projects, projects that are directly connected to the stability of the systems that they're on call for. Um, have an awareness that on call is stressful. Take some extra time to treat yourself during these times to help counter the stress, right? We know this is not the most delightful thing in the world. Let's just take some ownership around that and maybe treat ourselves a little bit. So uh, I talked to uh, Anna Medina from Gremlin about this a while ago, and she said that when she's on call, she schedules time to go have wine with her girlfriends or plans to go out for a favorite dinner. And the reason is she says that, you know, because on call week can be a really rough week, but then this gives her something to look forward to when she's on call. She has a special treat that she only does when she's on call. And... It's very tempting and common to fill ourselves with sugar and caffeine while we're on call. Um, this is kind of detrimental. Uh, you need to eat healthy, stay hydrated, drink a lot of water. This might sound like common sense, but it's really hard to remember to do. There is a physical effort to being on call. You might say it's kind of like being an elite athlete. 
in its own way, right? <laughs> so keep healthy, take care of yourself, take care of your body, and take care of your brain. And as always, because this is how I do talks, I went to Twitter for some suggestions, some ways that people provide self-care to themselves when they are going through on-call. So I kind of like this one, which was again talking about resting when possible, but it doesn't mean sleep. You know, you're not gonna sleep the whole week. Doing activities that are restorative, right? So this, uh, Cole likes knitting, so that's a relaxing thing. Getting outside, right? Uh, it can be hard to get outside sometimes, but you know, so YouTube yoga is a thing. And then this is a really key one, is saying no to other obligations. It's an exhausting time. It might be a time to say no to other obligations. Uh, Tammy says, you know, during a bad rotation, she curls up with the throw, throw rugs and tea on the couch. But I like to say, again, saying naps, going to the gym, uh, and then so during rotations and when there's no pages, be eternally grateful. So that's sort of a thing. It's like a Marie Kondo thing. It's like the end of your rotation, if you didn't get paged, thank that on-call rotation and let it go. I actually super do this, like when I have, because of my on-call, so I'm on-call as an incident commander at pager duty, and it's a 24-hour rotation, about every two weeks. And when that rotation is over and we didn't have an incident, I'm like, and especially like the last, the last 15 minutes of that rotation, you're like, oh, come on, please, 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 please. And, and this is even me talking about, we have a really good on-call culture, and it is not that stressful when you have incidents, and I actually enjoy being an incident commander and helping out, but I still super love it when no incidents happen during my rotation. Um, I like Matt's idea here, you know, get a massage if it's on call time, right? Treat yourself, you know, uh, running on a treadmill um, every time he gets adequate sleep, so it's a little bit of a reward. Uh, Jeremy takes his time to binge watch Netflix shows that his wife doesn't want to watch with him. Um, and then some maybe not great advice, uh, eating too many Pringles and potato chips and all those things. So this is Twitter, right? It's not always the best advice, so take it with a grain of salt. And then if all else fails, if none of these things help you in self-care when it comes to your on-call, we can always go with this. Sleep in, forget to put the phone on the charger, have the phone on quiet mode, and don't get called at all. And as Jeremy says, maybe this is why he is not part of on-call rotations anymore and now lives the DevRel life. So to kind of wind this up, remember, as Peter Levine says, right? So he says, you know, resilient strength is the opposite of helplessness. What does this mean? Being resilient means we don't think about things from the perspective of things that happen to us. It's a matter of what we can do going forward. And a culture of blame creates a culture of helplessness, right? So when we talk about, this is why blamelessness matters so very much. Because when we feel that we are in a culture where we as individuals can be blamed, we feel helpless. We feel like we cannot actually make changes. We're not allowed to make mistakes and it makes us feel very, very helpless. Um, the slides for this are available at, on my speaking page as well as uh, other, other talks that I have given. Um, I appreciate this. I'm, I'm happy to, if people have questions we want to talk about, I know I'm, I'm giving you a little bit of time back, but I know we got to get ourselves across because we've got Jesse Frizzell's talk that we don't want to miss, so I don't want to get in the way of that. But um, I would love to hear about uh, any instances, any kind of uh, tips and tricks and thoughts you have about uh, your experiences with OnCall. So. Thank you.